ship what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms what a blessedness what a peace is mine leaning on the everlasting arms leaning leaning safe and secure from all the
Our world has been seduced by celebrity culture. Fueled on the internet, uh, celebrities are followed and they're admired and they're mimicked and they're applauded. Why? Whatever for? Well, they make it big in the big leagues and we admire them for that. Or they broke a world record in the Olympics or they make big money. Or they live loud and large or they star in their own reality show or have particular creativity on social media, or with no more than a tweet, they can make crowds like or buy or vote their way. Celebrities. Ironically, their opinions carry huge weight on massive populations even when their personal lives are a train wreck. Isn't that an irony? Sad to say, not even the Christian world escapes that allure, that seduction. We've got celebrity worship leaders we can tune into on the radio. Big name preachers, sadly some of whom have been train wrecks too. We've got authors that some consider to really be worth buying and reading just because they make the best sellers list of this or that. Our obsession with fame, with celebrity, begs the question, does God really only use big names to do his work, or does he work through no names too? Can ordinary you and little known me really make a difference in God's grand plan? That's such an important question. Pastor Max Anders writes this, our world may be obsessed with celebrities, but God most often builds his kingdom through the faithful obedience of, you finish it, and all God's ordinary people said, Amen. through God's ordinary little known people. God loves to work through people with names few will ever recognize, no names, like us, like us. This should encourage us as we come to the last three Sundays of our series in God's letter to the Colossians, penned by the Apostle Paul to the Colossian church. Now, we've been in the Colossian letter for almost a year now, and we've watched how really there's only one big name that matters at all. Only one. One fully satisfying, all-sufficient person worth trusting, worth elevating to celebrity status, only one in the entire universe, and who is that? The Lord Jesus Christ. We've seen through our, our journey through the book of Colossians, this little letter, we've seen how vital it is that we trust him, untainted, the undiminished God-man, 
the all-sufficient sovereign and savior. We dare add nothing to him. We dare take nothing away from who he is. We dare not edit anything about him. We must take him as he tells us he is in his perfect word, not as philosophy or as human opinion tells us he should be or even as we wish he should be. Because to taint or to spin the truth about Jesus is deadening to our souls. It's deadly. He's the, all, uh, the utterly preeminent one. The one in everything. And so he must be if you and I are to thrive. We've seen how who Jesus is and what he's done for us by dying on the cross and by rising from the dead helps us to live forgiven and free, free. We've seen how he helps us live like we've already got one foot in heaven, almost there, but not yet. Because of him, our preeminent celebrity one, we can experience a constantly renewed mindset every day, peeling off our old sin habits, our grave clothes, and putting on his character traits that come from his life in us, his grace clothes, and we can live surrendered to him, allowing him to order our our lives, to order our attitudes, to order our longings and our relationships the way the sun holds the planets in place. And we've seen the life-giving importance of drinking in his word and breathing out our prayers. Do you know what we just did? We just traveled through 29 sermons. That's where we've been. That's what we've been absorbing through the letter to the Colossians. You'd think after all of that, the Apostle Paul would wind things up with a flourish, wouldn't you? Okay, Paul, let's see the grand finale now. But no. Instead, we'll turn to Colossians chapter 4 and see for yourself, Colossians 4 verse 7, in the, in the Bible in front of you, it's on page 985, and you'll see for yourself that Paul does something that's rather anti-climactic. He'll finish what's, with what seems like an unflourish this morning in Colossians chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Do you see it? He jots down a list of names. Yay. Right? H how exciting. <laughs> right? It's like he, scroll, he scrolls the credits. Whoever finishes a movie and watches the credits, not a whole lot of people do, do they? Well, Paul will use the last 12 verses of this powerful little letter to give us an ordinary group picture. That's what this is, of the little known, unfamiliar players that are connected to it. It's a group selfie. And Paul includes himself at the very end. Do you see that? In verse 18, I, Paul, he writes, write this greeting with my own hand. It's the way he authenticated all of his letters. Somebody, he, he dictated it to some secretary, to, an admin, to, to someone who penned it for him, and it was always at the end. He took the pen himself, and he wrote it in his own hand. And he goes, remember my chains. Grace be with you. He signs off, obviously, from prison, under house arrest in Rome. It's the price he's gladly paying to follow King Jesus. Let's remember again, as the Taliban steamrolls through Afghanistan, they've almost finished their, their whatever you might call it, their recapturing of the country. The hold, the grip that they had on it before is back. Jesus' followers are paying the price, not just in prison, but even with their lives, for loyalty to King Jesus. Just stop and ask yourselves, we're in a comfortable place today. We're in a safe place. But is Jesus worth that to you? Would Jesus be worth prison to you and to me? Would he be worth losing our lives, spending our life 
having our life cut short. Clearly, he tells us he's worth that. It's important for us to assess that ourselves. Most people skim over these last 12 verses, but we're not going to. Because packed into these last, this scrolling of the credits, this group selfie, this group picture, is a great deal of encouragement. I know it'll be. Passages like these help us to see how the truths of the Bible aren't just abstract theory pulled out of thin air, but paragraphs like these actually demonstrate how the truths of the Bible have relevance to our real life, my real life and yours. They show that the Bible flows from God into the very fabric of everyday lives, like yours and mine. We've, absorbed, we've been absorbing a real letter, not a, not a systematic theology book. We've been absorbing this letter from God's very heart, through Paul's heart, intended for real people, wrestling with real challenges in a real place in time that God then preserved down through time so that you, it would be his letter to us today over this last year. And so this group photo is meant to help us see how the grace, God's grace that floods to us and through us from our preeminent King Jesus can be lived out by ordinaries like you and me by little known us, and can make a real difference, a real difference. It's a picture of grace lived out. <laughs> this is Jesus' magnific magnificent work with boots on the ground. Boots on the ground. Let's pray, shall we? We need him to speak to our hearts. Lord Jesus, our supreme king, may you be our celebrity without, without equal. You are the conqueror of our souls. You're our savior. Show us, Lord, through these ordinary lives listed here how you, how you can and you want to use us, even us. Lord, would you fuel us this morning with an encouragement that can come from no other place than you in your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first guy in this group photo is Tychicus. Say, t say Tychicus. Yeah, go ahead. I, it's kind of Tychicus. It's kind of fun to say, right? Describe Tychicus with one word, and it's faithful. Faithful. Do you see verse 7? Tychicus, Paul writes, as he scrolls the credits, will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother, a dear Christ follower, and a faithful minister, a dependable worker, and a fellow servant in the Lord. And Paul is calling him, this guy is a real team player in God's work. Look at verse 8. I have sent him, Tychicus. Now, if you have a hard time with that, call him Ty. Call him Chico. Call him whatever nickname helps you remember him. Right? I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. You know, during the Roman Empire, official letters traveled up and down those Roman roads uh, through the military, through official ways. But personal letters were entrusted to a traveling friend like Ty. Paul has never met the Colossian Christians. Remember that? He's never met them in person. He's in prison, and so now he can't even send his warm personal touch through just anybody, so he picks trusty Ty. Trusty Ty. Tychicus is mentioned, if you Google him in Bible Gateway or something like that, you know, if you, if you try to bring up all the places in the New Testament that, that talk about him, you'll mention he's only mentioned and you'll see that he's only mentioned in five places in the New Testament. And then by putting that mosaic, those pieces together, you got to do a little bit of detective work. For some of you, this would be a lot of fun. It was for me this last week. We learned that Paul hands trusty tie three letters. One to the church in Ephesus, which is in our Bible. One, this one to the Colossians, which we've been working our way through. And a personal letter to Philemon, which also is in our Bible. But this is a dangerous job he has just given to Ty, to Tychicus. Tychicus will leave Rome 
I know that's a little complicated, but try to figure this out. He leaves Rome on the west side of the empire, sorry, east side of the empire, and west. West side of the empire, and he hoofs it across the boot of Italy to the Adriatic Sea to get on a boat. And then he'll walk across Greece, more miles of hiking, to get on a second boat to cross the Aegean Sea, where he drops off the first letter at Ephesus. Do you see the inset now? Ephesus. He drops the first letter off there on the coast, and then he finishes the arduous journey. This isn't safe. Bandits, weather, no motels, right? He finishes this arduous journey by hiking a hundred and some miles all the way to the Lycus Valley where there are three churches, Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis. Do you see them there? It's dangerous to take this trust on. <coughs> it's dangerous to deliver these letters. But Paul wants somebody trustworthy to also catch them up in person on how he is faring in prison, but even more to encourage them, to, to lift them up, to give them a boost. One pastor wisely states this. I love this. The most important ability in God's work is dependability. You're nodding. You get it. Amen. Amen. He's right. Tychicus embodied that. We wouldn't have this letter in our hands if it hadn't been entrusted to this man. We have this letter in our hands because of trusty Ty. And you didn't even know him very well before today, right? Maybe that's what God wants to harness in you. Are you dependable? Are you faithful? Are you a trusty tool in God's hand? Do you keep your word? Do you follow through even on details, even on seemingly small things like you're doing it for the king, for the one celebrity we celebrate? Even if nobody else notices, are you faithful? Are you dependable? The second guy in this group uh, photo we see in verse 9. Paul says, and with him, tagging along with trusty Ty, is Onesimus, say his, his name, Onesimus, our faithful, there it is again, same descriptor, and beloved brother who is one of you, Paul writes. He's a local from Colossae. He goes on, they, Ty and Onesimus, will tell you of Everything that has taken place here, you have no idea what Ty and Onesimus are going to tell them, especially when Onesimus shows back in town. Something incredible has given him the courage to go back home. You know, that Paul would write these glowing words about Onesimus, Onesimus is really unexpected. Something incredible has happened to him because he used to be a fugitive. He's an ex-fugitive. He was on the run. He ran as far from home as he could get to Rome. But... Let's leapfrog Onesimus and let's leave us dangling and focus, dangling here today and we're going to focus on him next week. Is that okay? That means you have to come back. That means I have to come back. Yes, Onesimus, a, a fabulous, littler, known person. The third guy we see in this photo is in verse 10. Aristarchus, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, Paul writes, greets you. Notice, he's in chains alongside of Paul. They're both under house, house arrest. But I love what's in the middle of his name, Starch. You see that? That'll help you remember him. This guy has got starch. Boldness is built into his name. You can squeeze the word fearless in between the descriptors that Paul has written there, fellow fearless prisoner, and that would fit him to perfection. Why do I say that? Because he's mentioned in four places in the New Testament. And in all of those, you find him shoulder to shoulder with the Apostle Paul, like Paul's wingman. 
and he's contending bravely for the gospel in every one of those four bits where you find him. In Acts chapter 19, he's being dragged by a mob. Search is being dragged by a mob and he's killed, almost killed, in the riot in Ephesus, Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 27, he's with Paul on the storm-tossed boat and is shipwrecked with the apostle Paul. And here, he's right alongside Paul in chains, in prison, fearless, fearless. Does that fit you? Does that fit you? You know, most of us are not naturally bold like that. And you and I probably need to pray, Lord, increase my courage for you. Build my, bold, my boldness for you. Make me bolder like Aristarchus. Don't forget what we've just been through uh, uh, studying about the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus rules over every authority and power in heaven and on earth should make Christians in Afghanistan today bold over every authority, yeah. seen or unseen, in heaven or on earth, the one in charge, that should make us bolder too. If we really take that to heart, oh, that God would give us that kind of backbone that this letter has been teaching us. What a wingman, eh? You know, it was really fun doing detective work this last week. You know what I learned about Starch, about Aristarchus there? You know, he was from Macedonia, a fabulous wingman, and Anne just looked at another guy from Macedonia. His roots go back there too. Isn't he a great wingman? <laughs> like, isn't that a neat, I love that. I love that. Fearless Aristarchus. There's a fourth guy in the photo, verse 10. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, Mark, this Mark, had another name, John Mark, concerning whom you have instructions, Paul continues, if he comes to you, welcome him. Paul, you've lost your marbles. Really? Welcome him? That's a 180 degree shift from, what, from when you gave up on him, Paul, in Acts chapter 12. John Mark shows up in seven other places in the New Testament. And what we know about him is that he faltered badly. He faltered. But that wasn't the end of his story, and we get to find out what happened to him two Sundays from now. Don't you love cliffhangers? <laughs> you have to come back. Let's keep scrolling. Verse 11. The fifth guy on Paul's group selfie is Jesus, not our celebrity, not our preeminent king, but Jesus, an ordinary little-known guy, called justice. That's the only place we really hear about him. There are other justices in the New Testament, that, but they're probably not the same guy. This is the only mention of him in the whole Bible. These, Paul writes, these last three men that I've listed are the only men of the circumcision, Jews, among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. And they, watch this, they have been, uh, you say it, a comfort to me. A comfort to me. Paul needed comfort, a comfort to those who spend themselves for Jesus. Is that you? Could that be you too? Do you step out of your way to phone or to do coffee with or to encourage or to boost someone you know loves to live for Jesus? Yeah. You know what the extra emotional weight on, on my personal life this week you can imagine that studying was harder. It was heavier. And when I finally closed my laptop last night, well, just before I did, I checked my email, and one of you in this room had written me an email early afternoon. And I cannot tell you how timely that was. I cannot tell you how beautiful and on point that was. I cannot tell you what a comfort it was. Others of you have done that for us too. I know you do it for each other, but that was right on time. And God knew it, a comfort, a comfort. 
Who comes next? There's Epaphras, number six, in verses 12 and 13. We're going to circle back to him if, after we glance at the remaining faces tagged in this photo. Um, Dr. Luke comes after that, number seven. See him in verse 14? Luke, the beloved physician. Do you get a, do you get a feeling that Paul loves his teammates? He, they're dear to him. Luke, the beloved doctor, greets you. Do you get the sense, too, that, he, that, that his co-workers really matter to him, no matter who they are? High-born bo- high or low-born, well-known or not, smart or not? Apart from the Apostle Paul, Luke might be the most famous and the most capable of anybody in this list here, in this group picture. But his priority, Luke's, wasn't his status. His priority wasn't his practice, that he was a doctor and practiced medicine, his priority was Jesus, King Jesus. And God used his top caliber skills to write the well-researched account of what Jesus said and did, the gospel of, you're on point. And then he goes on and writes the sequel, part two, what Jesus went on to do through his spirit in the apostles and in his people, in his church, in the book of Acts. Dr. Luke is pretty prominent. He harnessed his intelligence for Jesus in a way that took his skills and put them at Jesus' service. And wow, again, have we ever benefited, right? He's the only Gentile whose books show up in the Bible. A doctor, Dr. Luke. Are you harnessing your skills? Are you harnessing the abilities God has given you to do what God wants you to do as a priority for him, as a priority? Next comes Demas at the end of verse 14. Now, I was really tempted to just put a, just to strike the name off there. It's a tragic story. It's heartbreaking. Demas shows up in three spots in the New Testament, but the last one, you see Demas flakes and then he bails. Years from here, Paul will write Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 verse 10 that this man Demas loved the allure of celebrities, of pleasure. He loved this present world too much. Those pleasures tug at him. Demas drifts and deserts. His love for Jesus goes cold. And Demas serves us as a really good warning. Oh God, oh God, find us praying. Stoke my love for you. Don't let it diminish, Lord. Don't let it grow cold. Never let it die down. Keep competing loves far from me. May you always be my first love, Lord Jesus. Or as the hymn writer writes, oh, make me thine forever. And should I fainting be, Lord, let me never, never outlive my love for thee. Back to the picture, verse 15. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and to the church in her house. Verse 16, and when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. We get a first little glimpse now of how this was not just a personal letter from Paul to a group of churches or a a church that he loved. In fact, now you begin to see that this Colossian letter begins to circulate as something authoritative for other churches in the Lycus Valley. And this shows then part, the very first baby steps of how the Colossian letter is something that God preserved by his authority as his word to us too. Do you see the baby steps there? God preserving his word. Verse 17, and say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. The best that we can tell about these final two in the group picture about these little-known players in the photo, is that they opened their homes so that the church in their valley, the church in their locality, could meet under their roof. How practical. How practical. We get a hint 
If you go over to Philemon, in the first opening two verses of Philemon, we get a hint that Archippus might have been a part of Philemon's wealthy family, maybe a son, we don't know, and perhaps led the church that met in Philemon's house. Churches didn't meet in church buildings until well into the second century. They met in open places by a river, like near Philippi, right? Or they met in people's homes. They could just crammed in there, met in people's homes. You know, sometimes the best we have is to give God the use of something he's given us, just something practical, like the roof over our heads. God, use it. Use the roof over my head, would you please? And then to follow through without wavering on that practical commitment like Paul spurs Archippus to do here. So a good question here is, is there anything practical still left undone for Jesus? Do you have anything unfinished that you really want to get to? You know, let that be your nudge. Any practical thing, finish it, finish it. Did you know, this is a little excursus here, this fall we celebrate 200 years of existence as Keswick Christian Church. And did you know that our church family first started in somebody's home? His name was Darius Mann. Just opened his home so that the believers in this region could first start to meet and become and thrive Keswick Christian Church practical. How practical? Giving God the use of what you've got. Practical. Those are the 10 little known people that Paul mentions here at the end of Colossians as he signs off. But don't miss this important takeaway. Hear this loudly and clearly. As big a name as the Apostle Paul was in God's work, he couldn't do it alone. He couldn't do it alone. And Paul knew it. That's why he's scrolling the credits. God's work is teamwork. You fit. We're all part of the team. We're all part of his body. What role on the team do you play? What role is yours to play? Whatever your age, whatever your capacities. Now, let's finish by circling back to number six, Epaphras. He might encourage you the most this morning. I hope he does because the first time we bumped into him was in Colossians chapter, whoa, that's a little messed up, isn't it? Colossians chapter one, Colossians chapter one, verse seven. Do you remember him? He's the guy that came to know the Lord Jesus, the good news about Jesus, how and where we don't know, probably through Paul. And Jesus transforms Epaphras. He got so white hot with love and fervency for Jesus that he returns to his hometown in Colossae to share Jesus with his hometown, with his family, with his friends. (coughs) Excuse me. The Colossian church exists thanks to God's work through Epaphras' faithfulness. That's how Paul described him in in Colossians chapter 1 verse 7. There's dependability again. Dependability. But here, you've got to fill in some gaps. You've got to use your imagination a little bit. Epaphras probably wasn't as well trained or as Bible schooled as he needed to be. Imagine that. People come to know the Lord, they start gathering, they start worshiping the Lord, he's teaching them in Colossae, and suddenly the Colossian church is faced with tainted truth, with people just twisting the truth about Jesus a little bit or a lot. And it looks like Epaphras knows he's a little bit in over his head, and so he boots it back over the same route that Tychicus came all the way to Rome to find the Apostle Paul there and consult Paul about these problems, these challenges in Colossae. He sought counsel from Paul on how to answer those challenges. Now think about this for a second. Put two and two together. Do you find it strange knowing that Epaphras is a hometown boy? He goes to Rome. 
Do you find it strange that Paul's counsel recorded in the Colossian letter wouldn't be carried back by him? Why didn't Paul entrust this letter to Epaphras? Why didn't he entrust it to trusty Ty? What happens? We'll flip over to Philemon really quick, right? First and second Timothy, Titus, Philemon. It's page 1000 for you cheaters. I'm kidding. <laughs> I had to wake you up a little bit. For, for those of you who are less familiar with your Bible, it's page 1000. Don't be embarrassed. I'll give you time. Right? Philemon, chapter 1, verse 23. And where do we find Epaphras? You tell me. He's in prison. Alongside of the Apostle Paul and Aristarchus. Epaphras gets waylaid. He lands under house arrest along with the two others that we've seen. Paul and Starch, the fearless Aristarchus. Do you see that? So here's my practical question to us this morning. What do you do when God lets you get waylaid? When you feel like you, get, you love Jesus all out, your love for him is white hot, but you get stalled, you feel sidelined. An illness slows you down, or caring for someone who's ill slows you down or puts you on the sideline. Your body is winding down with age, and you simply can't do what you used to do. Life gets complicated, doesn't it? What do you do when you feel benched? Let's watch Epaphras for the answer. Starting in chapter 4, Colossians 4, back to Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, Paul writes, who is one of you, he's their hometown boy like Onesimus is, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in the will of God. For I bear him witness, Paul says, I could raise my hand in court if I had to, that he has worked hard for you. He's far from you. He's out of sight from you. He is working hard for you. And not just for you, not just for his church family in his hometown, but for the ones in his neighboring towns as well, for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis as well. Some of, of the best team players are those who, when benched, still cheer their hearts out from the sidelines. That's a team player. That's Epaphras. If he can't be there in person and play, he will pray. He'll pray. He'll pray. Many aging Christians spend their waning years on themselves. I know that's not you. They spend it on their pleasures. They wind down their days in seclusion, scrolling on their iPads, believing the lie that there's not much more that they can do at this stage of life. Not Epaphras. That's not him. We can take a really good hint from him. A fervent servant may be far from the playing field, but they're still involved, still white hot for Jesus. Is this you? Fervent servants consider themselves always able to serve King Jesus. Did you see that in verse 12? Always struggling in prayer. In prison, on the bench, struggling in prayer, always. A fervent servant of Christ is never truly sidelined. Some of you in this room, and maybe listening to, to me on, online, some of you are beginning to struggle, struggle with fading memories. That's all a part of the aging process, isn't it? That's part of, of our world winding down as well. Not even that can demote you from serving your Lord. Keep using, keep using what God leaves with you as long as you can. Even that is magnificent in his hand. As long as you can, until it slips away, let God use whatever way you can pray to him for the ones you love. And then when even that slips away, his spirit will interface with your spirit to give you comfort until it's time to get home. You can count on that. You're never fully 
on the bench. Do you hear me? It's so encouraging, isn't it? Fervent servants. So here's the point. Keep using what you still have for Jesus as long as you can, as long as you have it. Like this. Fervent servants keep leaning hard into God in prayer. Even if you don't have the words, God's spirit knows your heart, knows groanings. He can translate what little we have to fit the throne room of heaven. If you can do nothing else, you still have impact potential by prayer. Epaphras did. He struggled. Literally, that, that's, that means agonized. He agonized like an athlete agonizes in sport. No pain, no gain. It's hard work. Verse 13 told us, don't give up. Struggle. It's hard work. Lean into God. And fervent servants pray on target. They pray in, in line with God's will, that God's people will stand fully assured in all of God's will. So focus as you pray on what God wants to do in the lives of his people. John 6, 29 tells us that God's will is for people to believe in Jesus as their rescuer, as their God-sent salvation. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3 tells us that his will is that for those that come to Jesus should grow in Jesus, should grow more godly, should grow in holiness, should keep themselves from the corruption of the world and from the pleasures of the world and grow in love, more love, greater love with Christ. Pray that way. Pray on target. Epaphras never felt benched. Neither should you. Ever. Ever. Even in prison, he leaned into God. And the Colossian church family was the better for it, even though he couldn't be the one that carried the letter to them. Do you see it? Wow. So as you know, my dad passed away this last Monday at age 88, but my most trusted visual memory of him as I was growing up was visualizing my dad huddled as a habit at the breakfast table before the sun was even up, huddled over his Bible, his open Bible, quietly pouring out his heart in prayer for those he loved, for the churches he worked with, my in-laws are well into their 90s. They rely on walkers. Their mornings are spent with an open Bible, God's word open, in fervent prayer for the people they love and the churches they've served over a lifetime. Fervent servants. That can certainly be us. We can certainly do that. Does God only use big names to do his work or does he work through no names little known names like us you know the answer now don't you this closing group selfie Paul uses to show us that the kind of little known people like these are people that like us are people that God does use <laughs> that God does use which of them is most like you are you dependable are you fearless? Are you a comfort? Are you capable? Do you open your home? No matter who you are, however upfront or background, however well-known or not so well-known, the most powerful thing we can do in our ordinariness is to be fervent servants. Fervent servants and lean into God in prayer. Pastor Steve, does God really do use that? Does God, does God really use that kind of little-known person? Let God answer that question through Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. Let me read it to you. Ready? Here's God's answer to your question. God is not unjust so as to overlook, overlook your work, whatever it is. God is not unjust so as to overlook your work work up front or in the background, outside or in your closet, and to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name by serving the saints as you still do. Whatever you, <laughs> your hand finds to do for the Lord, he says he doesn't overlook it. 
he notices. And so a fervent servant never quits. Never quits. Because the only big name that matters is the Lord Jesus Christ, is our Savior's name. Let's pray. Lord, before we opened your word, we, el- we, we lifted our voices in song to celebrate you. You're our king. You're our God. You're our victor. And now we lift our souls to you again and recommit ourselves, telling you, Lord, use us. The much or the little we have left, use us. Use what we have in practical ways. But, oh God, would you harness us and leverage all that we are towards your kingdom. Help us to keep encouraged as fellow teammates on your team, in your household, in your body, we pray. For Jesus' fame, we live and we pray. Amen.